Welcome to this episode of Drink Forex, where we bring you interesting conversations with leading financial professionals. Uh, we're super excited today. We have Kiana Danielle from uh, Invest Diva on the show. She's been featured on programs on, on CNN, CNBC, and frequently has articles published on the NASDAQ. So thank you for joining us. We're thank excited you. to speak with you. How was your flight in? It was great. Oh my God. We. Uh, we had a very early flight, so I had to get, get up at 3. I normally get go to bed at 12 because I'm trading <laughs> at the Asian session, and then so I had to get up at 3 and catch a very early flight. So yesterday was completely gone, and we slept basically during, during the day yesterday, and today I'm kind of back on track. Okay, that's yeah. good. And you flew in from New York? Yes. Okay. Yes. How are you enjoying Florida so far? Oh, it's great. It's the break from because it's it's becoming miserable now in New York with the weather and uh, it's getting colder. <laughs> obviously, no snow is yet, but so it's a good break now. I'm 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 rocking my sleeveless. <laughs> <laughs> not not in a winter coat. <laughs> yes, yes. So even though it's not that it's not as hot as I thought it, it will be, but I'm still embracing it. My it's yeah. still better. Now. Right. It's um, no, it's certainly cooled off in the last couple of weeks. Uh, where I think it gets high at like seventy-five to eighty during the day. Uh, where two, three weeks ago it was still a hundred degrees. Oh wow! Um, yeah, it's it can get miserable. Yeah. It, it was my first summer down here, and I did not enjoy it at all. Really? <laughs> not not the summer. It's now it's great. Really, now it's yeah. now it's obviously wonderful weather. But yeah. um, imagine you're dead of January and you don't want to go outside because yeah. how cold it is, oh, it's, it's the hot. reverse down here where you don't want to go outside because it's so hot and like your air conditioner can't keep up with the outside temperature. Oh. So, you know, you'll set your air conditioner at 70 degrees, but your house will be at 75 because the AC just can't keep up keeping it cool. Wow, um, and humid too, I bet. Yes, obviously, oh. 100% humid yeah. <laughs> you know, all the time. <laughs> I think I would enjoy that. I'm always cold. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Always, but I but, get it. No, if it's too hot, I might pass out too. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. Thanks again for coming down. Um, it's it's an honor to have you on the show. You know, us, us little guys that drink Forex, you're used to the big, flashy spotlights of CNBC and CNN. So I appreciate taking time. Um, you know, I, I'd just like to start. Like, you have a you have quite a unique history um, of where you come from and how you got your start into the industry uh, to where you're at nowadays. Can you just go a little bit into your background and, and how you got your start into this industry? Yes, of course. So uh, I'm not your typical trader. Let's say that way. Um, uh, I was an engineer. Uh, I studied engineering in Japan. Oh, okay. Let's go a little bit even further back. <laughs> I was born. <laughs> I was born and raised in Iran, okay. and um, so I was a religious minority there. So this whole minority thing, bear with me. I, I have a point. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> we're not here to judge. We're, we're an all-encompassing, all-accepting podcast. So yes, yeah, so yeah. I was there um, as a minority, uh, and I had very big goals of becoming the first female person of Iran <laughs> or becoming an astronaut. So I had all these goals. So I had nothing to do with finance or trading at the time. Uh, and then um, because I was very interested in math, uh, I applied for a scholarship program to study engineering in Japan because I wanted to become an electrical engineering. Okay. That was one of the goals that kind of got, got achieved and uh, I got the scholarship. Uh, when I was 18 and so I wasn't really sure if I want to stay in Japan or I'm just gonna go and see how it is and um, but I took the opportunity despite my parents just being completely <laughs> furious like where are you why Japan out of all, all places right because uh, my family was here in the US like I had the opportunity to come directly here but I just okay. was like all right I'll just go see it's six months I'll see what happens and I went there and I loved it uh, the first, like if you go to Japan the first six months a year is unbelievable is amazing and I was like you know what I'm just gonna stay here and my dad had no control over me anymore so <laughs> right. like, Hi. So, <laughs> so I stayed, I studied, I learned Japanese so that I can go to college. So you didn't know it before going over? No, 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 no not at all. I barely oh. knew English. So, uh, yeah, so far So how many speak, languages do you speak then? Uh, well, fluently three. Okay. Which are? So now it's English, Farsi, and Japanese. Okay. And um, so, I, I mean, I, I speak that. Uh, very broken Arabic and Hebrew, but um, yes, yeah, so I, I wouldn't be able to 
hold a conversation in those languages. Okay. Uh, but at the time, uh, I'll tell you how I learned English because that isn't everybody's like, <laughs> oh, yeah. English is not your first language. I'm like, yeah. yep. You're very fluent in it. Like you would never know that it's not your first language. Thank you. But it gets me into trouble because people think it's my first language. Then I make a tiny mistake and they're like, <laughs> are you stupid or something? Why did you sound like, it's not my first language. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> but no, I learned it uh, watching movies. Really? And Friends, the sitcom. Okay. Over and over and over again. Probably a hundred times. So, so which is your favorite Friends character? Uh, well, really? Ross season one to two. Uh, wow, you're breaking it down weird. into seasons. Yeah, no, he gets weird after season three. <laughs> no, I like them all. I really, I'm, I'm like one of the biggest fans of Friends, and I saw yeah. one. I met actually one of their authors afterwards when I came to New York, uh, which is oh my god, great. Uh, but um, so, anyways, so I went to Japan, not speaking. I mean, speaking kind of English, zero in Japanese. So with the program, they put us in a. Um, course that we had we would learn like advanced Japanese language course okay. every year and uh, so that was just scratch uh, learning on uh, well a little bit of academia like I was able to uh, read newspapers like the Chinese characters and everything understand it like 70% by the end of that year um, and um, but I was able to hold on a conversation by the end of that. Wow. And then they sent us to our respective, very technical engineering schools. Uh, so at the, at the Japanese school, it was international students from everywhere in the world. That was what really draw, uh, drew me into it and was very exciting. Mm -hmm. But then the second year, after I got sent to the college, I was the only girl and the only foreigner. <laughs> Such as class. engineering, yes. it's a very male dominated, as bad as it is, but it's a very male dominated industry. It is, it absolutely is. And um, I wasn't expecting it to be that way because I thought like, well, it's Japan, it's like advanced, it wouldn't be that way, but it right. definitely was. And uh, so that is when it kind of started becoming hard and uh, well, the terminology, studying electrical engineering in Japanese, is, it's like the, the things that they taught us in the first year had nothing to do with the technical terminology that was needed to understand electrical engineering. Yeah. And so that's why I had to really, like I, I would, in, during the class I wouldn't understand what the teacher was saying. So I had to put up, either, either report it or like get the notes from uh, my classmates and then translate that into English and then I wouldn't understand that either and then translate that into Farsi and then try to make sense of what's going on. <laughs> right. But that's how also I, I learned English because it was like Japanese and English Farsi. Okay. So I was basically studying three things at a time. Engineering, Japanese, English. So wow. just, um, So that went on um, for, so the first my first degree, I got it after three years, and in order to keep my scholarship, I had to be like top of the class, which is basically yeah. just studying all the time. And then I got my second second degree. I went to Tokyo, and um, so total seven years. In Japan. Seven years. Uh, so your first degree is electrical engineering, and then Again, your electrical second. Engineering. Okay, so it's like a master's advanced yeah, degree. Yeah, okay, advanced one. It's not called directly master, so it depends a little bit different in that sense where I went was a technical advanced it's called COSEN uh, and then we got a, I got a degree on top of that so that it translates into other countries because okay. they didn't really get what right. I studied <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was, I was talking with somebody the other day it's, it's weird like I, I would think all education systems are, are strong but I was talking with somebody they moved over here from Latin America or moved up here from Latin America and they were a doctor down there but they were not allowed to be a doctor here until they went and passed medical school in the United States. It's like, well, if you're a doctor down there, you're performing the surgery, it's like, why make them go through through everything again? Well, I mean, I, I think it's understandable. Well, the interesting thing is, so I don't know about medicine and how, well, America does have the, um, you, you would think it's more progress in the, in the field of medicine, but engineering, like Japan, I thought like this is it. Japan is the most advanced in, right. in that field. But turns out, still like 
Americans are more advanced. Well, they, <laughs> so. well, they, they did a, I watch a lot of news and read a lot of articles, but I was, Japan, apparently they had a sinkhole in the middle of one of their major cities last week. Yes. It had a big sinkhole, open, exposed, and they were asking the commentators, like, how long do you think this took them to fix? There was like six months, a year, two years, whatever. Two days. Yeah. Literally, two days, they filled in this giant hole with dirt, and they're like, yeah, we made it 600 times stronger than what it was. They're very so efficient like, like that. Like, that's what I really love about Japan. There are so many things that I don't like about Japan, but their efficiency... We'll stick with, with the positives. Well, their efficiency <laughs> yeah. in everything. Uh, the way people, like, the way even people walk on a very busy street. So Tokyo has, I think, three times more uh, population than New York. Mm -hmm. Really? But you never run into someone who are not going. It's like everything is very well managed. Their trains are well managed. They're, it's, it's amazing how people are respectful, manageable, efficient, with time, with everything. It's, right. That is, I think, one of the, and also teamwork. One of the things that they really <laughs> excel on is teamwork. And I think what, what makes them very successful in efficiency because people are not like, there, are, there is not a hundred kind of different ideas. One person comes up with the, with the idea and the rest really just help with that idea. Okay. Um, so it's interesting. It's very, it's like a contrast between that and the US. Right. Yeah, we're, we're very inefficient running. Very <laughs> like you, you mentioned running, yeah, opinionated <laughs> running into people on the streets. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> so you were, you were in Japan for seven years. You finished with your quote unquote master's degree. Did you attempt to go into that industry or did you just like, this isn't for me after seven years, like I, I'm finished with it, I'm going to finance or like how, how did that transition occur? So very interestingly, so I was in college still in 2008 when the markets crashed and I didn't know a bit about finance. Like I didn't understand what the term financial crisis mean. <laughs> I, learned, I heard Lehman Brothers went back on that. Oh, Lehman Brothers, I had to Google, okay, Lehman Brothers, oh, okay, it's a bank. So um, I didn't know anything about it. The only thing that I noticed at the time was that the US dollar was getting weaker. And I had uh, an accumulation of a ton of Japanese yen in my bank. And uh, my family was here. I knew that at some point I might want to go to, to America. So I was like, you know what, maybe it's a good time to change my Japanese yen into the US dollar. Okay. And I was in college and I would go to my ATM. You can, you can change, uh, do exchange right in, in, in an ATM. What's the markup on that? <laughs> uh, it's actually very reasonable from what I remember. But um, so it's just like you change it, like you do an exchange from your Japanese saving account to your well, US dollars in the account. Okay. And I was doing it like every day was September, it was August 2008. And I, was, I could sense that the market is going even lower and lower. And I was talking to like my friends and I'm like, yeah, it's going to go even lower. And I'm like, okay, when is the best time to really like change it and make the best out of it? Because right. if I change it at like, let's say at the time, it started at 107 and then it was just going down. So I, it just became my habit. Every day I would go and change some of it and the next day would go lower, I'll change a little bit more of it. And I was like, oh, I can't do this every day. I wish like I could write a program so I could set a limit that I can. <laughs> so these are the actual words that I use. Right. I was talking about out of nowhere with one of my Japanese friends who was a woman, my Japanese mom, the right. family. And uh, she's like, yeah, there, there's already a program about this. It's called Forex. I'm like, what's that about? It's like, yeah, and not only you can set a limit, you can also like uh, take advantage of leveraging and, I'm like, all right, I don't understand what you're saying, but can you help me? And she did. And within a month, as, as the markets crashed, I uh, I made like ten thousand dollars, and uh, so for a college student, I was right? <laughs> and I, I put in like ten thousand dollars, and I doubled it within a month. And I'm like, oh my god, this is yeah. awesome! <laughs> this is the easiest thing in the world. Yes. <laughs> so I was already kind of frustrated with engineering, and uh, I definitely didn't want to work as an engineer. So I was looking into different fields. Um, oh, so my specialty at the time was um, data analysis, radar systems data analysis with my master's. But um, so my first job after I after graduated, I still didn't want to immediately get into. I, I didn't like think of getting into finance. Okay. I was like, okay, I'll become an analyst at a consulting firm. Uh, so that was my first job, and uh, but I was also interested. In like, okay, so that investment really worked out. 
So I got approached by a money manager who was like, okay, I like I don't know how they found me. Like they had this radar. So like, oh, we understand that you're interested in investing, but you don't know how to do it. We can help you. I'm like, the, okay, the cool. Forex industry. <laughs> there were all a bunch of creeps. It wasn't Forex. It was it was everything in general. So oh, okay. uh, it wasn't only Forex, right? So it was a money manager. I'm gonna tell the names because they stole my money. My uh, friend's oh. Provident. So um, he was like, oh yeah, we have a team of investors that are like located in a remote area but at the time because it was in Japan I it's very easy to trust people there because people normally don't screw you over and it was like okay interesting yeah I am interested because I did like invest a little bit and I made money and yeah why don't you do it and I'll go become an analyst at a company right so um, so they started basically taking money I sorry like putting money in my account so they can invest in it. it was supposed to be like a, a snowball effect but they just what strategies were they investing or what products I guess um, they had yeah. mutual funds and so at the time I didn't even understand what it was all it was, Japanese mutual funds no 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 it wasn't even in Japan they were these were foreign money managers who came to Japan targeting foreigners who live and make money in Japan telling them that this is an equivalent of 401k in the US okay wow so that's how I got into it because in Japan we don't they don't have 401k right. and I'm like, okay and I didn't know what 401k was so he explained to me and he's like okay so we can help you and I'm like okay this makes sense all right I'll do that right. and um, but of course I never saw that money again I'm still in talks with them. I'm trying to get something out of it. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this still, is back from 2008? Yes. Oh, wow. Yep, it's still, it's still going on. I'm surprised um, it didn't just disappear like a lot of no, those people end up No, they just doing. came up with new rules. They're like, oh, you can't, you can't get the money out now. And I'm like, well, but the agreement said that I can. And they're like, they come, they're coming up with all these sort of uh, reasons why. And I, so like, what was the name again? Just so everybody can steer, <laughs> steer clear of this company. Friends Providence. Friends, Providence. Friends. So, no, friends. friends. Oh, friends. friends. Like friends. Like you and I, friend. friends. Friends, Providence. Providence. Yeah. So steer clear of that. Do not invest with that firm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it just worked bad for me, but this really has been the case. And um, so that is when I got really pissed off because the amount that I invested in them, it was my first job. It was actually very well paid. Uh, well first time <laughs> analyst I would say <laughs> in Japan it's easier to make money I would say and uh, but I invested all that money in them and uh, that really got me pissed off so this basically was the end of my Japan experience I had experienced Forex like really briefly and then I got scammed by people who were professionals right and I'm like okay so maybe I should just get into the finance industry myself but still I didn't make the decision yet I got um, at my first job, my boss sent me uh, on a business trip to the U.S. That was my first trip to the U.S. Okay. And uh, I went to DC. I went to LA. I went to DC, and then I went to New York. And I just absolutely fell in love with New York. And I'm like, okay, this is it. I am coming to New York. I'm going to the financial headquarters of the world, <laughs> and I'm going to, because my first love, let's say, the financial world was 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 forex. I decided to just go to Wall Street and get a job there. And I, after two weeks, I actually got a job and- Wow, that's quick. <laughs> I, yeah, Some I mean, of us, it takes a little longer, but- the, Well, the story was compelling, I would say, <laughs> for the, for this, oh, you did Forex and you're an analyst. So it kind of, uh, it, you know, was a perfect fit at the t at that time. And did it help speak in three languages at the time as well? Like, yeah, obviously, it's a very I, international <laughs> business. It is. So yeah. it really, like, I, I really now understand why Forex looked like it was kind of meant to be because I'm mm. able to communicate with people all around the world. Not all around the world, but it's easier. And um, so I started there and learned more and more about it. So I moved, obviously. Like, within two months of my, of my business trip, I moved to, to, the, to New York. And okay. um, uh, so after a year in Wall Street, uh, again, I was the only girl. <laughs> and... <laughs> and uh, uh, well, in the analysts within, the, I was in the analyst. I wasn't in the analyst team, by the team, but I noticed that uh, well, there are not many female forex broker, and I noticed that even though this is the U.S., again, I had high hopes that oh, the U.S. is like this 
pioneer of male female equality and stuff like that. So it really wasn't, especially in on Wall Street. It was not. No, right. not at all. And I kind of pitched to my boss, like, why don't you target women? Like, and the marketing team, like, why don't you target women? Like, it is an interesting, like, it's half of the population. Uh, and then I learned, I read some research that, I mean, I'm not sure if it's true, uh, but there are there are there are, there are researches that says women are better with investing uh, because of their yeah. natural like hormones and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, yeah. like, more risk averse. Risk averse. Okay. Yes. Um, so nothing to do with like them being more analytical no. or like taking a longer term approach. It's just longer yeah. term approach and more risk averse. Okay. Uh, eventually, especially in forex, uh, has proven to be a better approach, and, and women have that natural ability to do that. Not every woman. I mean, now in Investive, I come across so many women who are as risk have more risk appetite than any man that I've ever known. Right. But in general, <laughs> that was basically what I read. And I was like, okay, so maybe I should just go and uh, educate women. And that would be something that is my calling maybe. So right. um, that's what I did. What year was this that you started? So 2011. 2011, okay. That's when I started Investiva. So uh, it wasn't a... Um, quick transition because after my first job I then became I worked at so many different layers of forex industry I worked with a liquidity provider to help them with their Japanese expansion I worked as an analyst on forex TV and I worked as so I, I kind of branched out and I did the customer face-to-face -face customer kind of job I did the mm -hmm. back end and I learned more and more about uh, the forest industry as in general okay. uh, in that process. And that really helped me with understanding uh, how brokers make money, how you can take advantage of how brokers make money, and right. uh, also more, of course, on the analytics side. And uh, I'm still learning, everybody's still learning. Um, but that was my basically first attempt to go and empower and educate women and bring them to the forex industry and since then uh well forex is now not the only thing that i do and i got educated i got more licenses and uh i studied wealth management uh, so that i can help my students to manage their risk um risk tolerance better and risk management basically better okay so you're a certified financial planner is that uh, the correct terminology not yet yes not but yet. i have okay. i have a so you need two years of practice after i just started that i did the course okay uh, and then now i teach that in Boulder college but i i still don't have the title yet so um okay. uh it takes time to have like um, a number of years of practice to get the title but right. i have done the education and I teach it at a college so okay. yeah maybe <laughs> I'm a financial <laughs> planner not a certified yet so okay I uh, but I just use that to help my students with their forex strategies so did you have to get different licenses for that like or do you hold any like series license no, you know, no, so, okay. because I'm not a broker okay and I um, don't get any I don't receive any sort of commissions so that's why I didn't really have to go after the oh, okay. series. Uh, it's solely an educational company. Just uh, I don't okay that, because of that reason. Right. So, okay. Yeah, just so have just providing education yes. services. Okay. Yeah. So, Always fascinated from the regulation side of it. Like it, every, especially here in the FX industry, every country is different, and how they interpret things are, are different. Um, so that's, yeah, that's interesting to know that if you're just solely providing education in the States that you don't have to get, get regulated. Yes, exactly. Because, um, I don't work on commission. So the commission is, I, I believe is what requires the regulation because mm -hmm. now, I mean, if you do, if you trade or not trade, I, I don't care. I just want you to be educated on how to trade. Right. If you end up not trading at all. I don't care. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> that, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so that's so so you help 
So the, the goal was then to, to get the financial certificate uh, to help people in their FX investments, as well as their other investments, I'm assuming, just make, make more educated decisions before they just pull the trigger and be like, hey, I want to buy the, the dollar, dollar yen, you know, like with no education whatsoever behind that logic. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, in terms of your education, I know you have a new book coming out. Um, what's the name of the, the book? I know it's a focus on Ichimoku. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's, the, what's the name of the book? It's called Ichimoku Secrets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so is most of your, so that's exciting. Congratulations on that. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll put a link so people can, can find it uh, in the comments. Um, is your education, does it revolve around Ichimoku? And is that how you pronounce it? Sorry, I know a lot of people butcher it. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a new concept here in the States. I know it's a very Asia technical indicator, but uh, here in the States it's new. So is that how you pronounce it? Am yeah. I doing it properly? Yes, yes you're good. <laughs> um, and then is this, so is your education built around this premise uh, of this technical indicator? Uh, not not all of it. So my first book, which was published by McGraw Hill, that was just um, my my real strategy that I still use is I call it the Investiva Diamond Analysis, which is uh, analyzing the markets from three different points. So I go to the fundamentals, I uh, do the technical analysis, and I look at the market sentiment, and then so there are five points of it. So these are the three. Uh, market analysis and sure. analytics points and then you have your own risk appetite and risk tolerance analysis and then at the end you pull the trigger so the, the, the fifth one is also you want to feel good about it so uh your gut instinct that kind of analysis sure. is also <laughs> comes comes so it, it's like the diamond so the five points of the diamond analysis but so my um basic education is that um had a combine the fundamentals, technicals, market sentiment with your risk tolerance and create a successful winning portfolio. And uh, yes, I did start with Forex and then I got also involved with, with stocks and ETFs because Forex really is the hardest one and if you nail that then stocks and uh, right. ETFs are really like bread and butter. So, Do you think that's because like the volatility that comes with FX? Is the uh, volatility and um, also uh, the amount of leverage that you can incorporate into your trading? It 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 brings in a lot of emotions. Uh, so mm -hmm. the volatility and the leverage, the forex traders in general become more eventually, I would say, emotional about trading, and that is when things go down. Yeah. Uh, just analyzing the market is very interesting. Like you, you can, I, I have. Come across a lot of students that I've taught how to do, and they would do the analysis perfectly. But then when they actually start trading, because they get emotional about it, they just screw it up. Uh, so um, that's why if you are able to manage your emotions with forex, <laughs> then managing your your emotion emotions with stocks and ETFs is uh, a little bit easier. Also, uh, of course, when it comes to analysis, um, forex is a little bit more technical driven. Uh, stock market follow the fundamentals a little bit more uh, okay. than technicals, but there are still a lot of uh, mutual areas right. uh, in that sense. But yeah, so the new book, Ichimoku Secrets. Um, Ichimoku is one of my most favorite technical analysis methods. I don't use that only, but it's one of the, one of the um, tools that I use most often and okay. most frequently and the times that I don't use it are the times that I think I'm losing trade. <laughs> That's when the emotions are getting the yes. best of you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so yeah, so I would like see the signal I'll ignore and like nah, this is just wrong, it's not working and then I'm like oh, damn, I lost money. <laughs> so um, I came across Ichimoku, of course, it's a Japanese indicator, it was invented by Japanese guy Goichi something if I forget his name right. so, um, <laughs> <laughs> Chi -chi. <laughs> also that all right Oops, yeah that, right of course. so it was invented by a Japanese journalist Goichi um, Hosoda in 1936 and um, so it is pretty new in the Western world it is a combination of five different moving averages okay again I'm not a moving average trader 
uh, one of, so let me just explain what Ichimoku is. Uh, Ichimoku in Japanese translates into, so Ichi means one, Moku means looking, or so it's like first glance. Okay. So you have five moving averages that basically tells you what's going on in the market in the first glance. The full name of Ichimoku is Ichimoku Kinkokyo, so it's, um, it's basically a chart, a look at the chart in the first glance. Um, and um, so the moving averages, they consist of two, well, normal or average moving average, a fast speeding moving average, which is called the um, Tenkan line or the turn line in English, uh, which is calculated by averaging the highest high and the lowest low in the past nine uh, periods. Okay. Uh, so you can you can use Ichimoku in any time. You can use it on a daily chart, monthly, four hour. Oh, hour. that's interesting because yeah. a lot of, I know a lot of people talk about technical indicators where they only work on you know they work best on five minute charts or they work best on longer term frames. Right. Um, I mean, so I get asked that quite often. Um, the the answer to that is that it really depends on what you are trading and what your risk tolerance is and how long of a trader you are. If you're a long term trader, then you're going to use the monthly chart and you're going to apply Ichimoku to that. And it basically, so the Ichimoku Kinko, the Ichimoku, the, uh, the Ichimoku Kinko here on the monthly chart basically shows you the market sentiment from a long term perspective. So if you want to remain in that investment for two years, then yes, you want to look at the market sentiment of long-term traders in the long-term point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't quite agree. I've, I've used Ichimoku Tinko here in different time frames, and it basically, so I, I use a combination of Ichimoku with Fibonacci, and if you combine these two, okay. they basically work in any time frame. And any pair as well, or there's certain pair, okay. absolutely. Because I know that's a lot of people talk about technical indicators. Not only is it limited to the time frames that it works on, but it's also which pair it's going to work on. Where they need certain ones need the volatility, and if there's not, if it's not a high volatility pair, then it's not going to work. No, I mean, um, so so in the book, I actually precisely have gone and uh, looked at all the major processes. I haven't looked at the minor miners. I don't really trade the miners. Okay. Uh, there was a. Uh, not a rumor, but uh, some people do believe that Ichimoku works best with yen crosses because Ichimoku was invented right. in Japan and <laughs> Japanese people trade the most. But the fact is that market sentiment is market sentiment. It's pretty global. Right. And when yen gets weaker, uh, like even like with the US election, when, when we see the dollar yen is getting stronger, so that makes Japanese yen weaker. And then uh, you, get, you get that impact indirectly into other pairs as well. Right. So, um, I, I have noticed that Ichimoku no here has actually worked across uh, the currency pairs. It does not work as well with the stock market. Okay. Uh, but with Forex, I'm, I explain why in the book. So, so go buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's the moral of the story. Uh, um, yeah, but what I use the most in Ichimoku is the cloud, which. Okay. Is a moving average plotted ahead in the future? Which is Interesting, something. because most technical indicators just chart previous um, occurrences in the market. So this actually goes into the the future and helps you somewhat not predict, but gives you a guidance of, of what could occur. Exactly. Right. So um, it, the cloud is basically the area between two separate moving averages. One of them is that turn line that I just talked about with a slow moving average which is called the Kijun or the baseline. So it averages those two and it plots it 26 periods ahead. And then another line, uh, which is uh, the highest, the, the average of the highest high and the lowest low of the previous 52 uh, periods, okay. plotted again 26 periods ahead. Okay. And then the area between these two moving averages is called the cloud. And that is what I use the most. And it has been one of the most remarkable uh, turning point, like sentiment shift uh, indicators. Uh, and so if you go on Google and uh, what I've written in this book is not what you, you will find in, uh, by just searching. It's something that I've actually traded on and it's not 
so what you see on on search engines and like and, and the free material is the, the general guidance on what HTML is and the general in, interpre, uh, interpretations of it. Right. But this one is actually something that I've tested over and over again through the combination with Fibonacci. And so based on, on your, if you combine that with your risk appetite, that really gives you the edge okay. on um, getting into the market at the right, right time, getting out at the right time, and not going off your... So are you looking to, sorry to interrupt, but are you looking to trend follow with it? Or like, is it more of like a mean reversion indicator? It's a reversion or yeah. entry point. So I use a Jumoku cloud as an entry signal. Okay. And I, then I use Fibonacci levels as exit, and uh -huh. then I combine these two. So depending on your risk tolerance and risk yeah. appetite, uh, you use different levels of both Ichimoku and Fibonacci so okay. that it really best matches uh, your trading strategy, your uh, future financial goals, and what you want to do. Because um, if you don't have high risk tolerance, then you can't just go and use the method that somebody like me who has higher risk tolerance uses, right? So okay. it kind of gives you that um, edge and flexibility and uh, there is not one pill for all. It's, so in the book I, right. I basically go through like who, what type of trader should use which type of combination okay. and which time frame for that matter. Okay. That, uh, that's very helpful. Um, obviously I, I'm more of a longer term style of a trader. So I, I'm looking at four hour plus longer charts. Um, it's funny, I was doing another interview and he's like, he was telling me, he's like, yeah, I look at four hour and daily charts, but then I also look at the five minute to get in. But so for me, like I, I have a very low risk tolerance. I'm a longer term trader. So I try to really pick my spots to get in for the, for the long term, which it can be difficult. You know, uh, you know, if you're looking at a daily chart, there can be a hundred pip move in that day. Um, so with your, I guess my point is with your, your, your analysis on it, you help narrow in that, that range of where you should sort of be looking to get into the market. Like it can help with that. that Absolutely. So I'm yeah. just like you, I am a long-term trader. I trade on the daily chart. I look at the four hour monthly chart and the five minute chart that you look. So that is basically the market sentiment. It's, it can be very helpful in understanding what the market is doing and it can go against it. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, with Ichimoku on the longer term uh, trend, so it helps you with different things. First of all, what currency pair to trade? Because mm -hmm. when you add Ichimoku across your uh, well currency pairs on your broker's platform, that is how I choose what to, what to trade. I look at it at the glance, <laughs> all right, in one glance. And I'm like, okay, I'm looking at pound yen, uh, not really a signal there. I look at dollar yen, I look at euro dollar, I look at, oh, kiwi dollar, oh, there is a signal. So you can like really quickly, this basically takes me 10 minutes in the morning. I don't trade every day, but because I have to uh, set up, well, signals and education for my students, I definitely look at the markets every single day. And that is how I choose what to cover and yeah. where there is opportunity for people who are probably not it's because I don't trade like uh, more than uh, a number of uh, 20 pairs at a time so unless my I have reached my target I don't go with a different oh, pair. so you just trade one product at a time or no, one pair product. at a time so be, be, based on my risk tolerance so right now and and my winning and losing positions I kind of balance it out I don't go over uh, what my risk tolerance requires me so if I Today, if I can only be in five uh, or remain in five positions, even if there is a great signal based on Ichimoku, I won't just get in it. I will just right. let it go. I'll pass it on to a person <laughs> who can yeah. actually take advantage of it today, right? Uh, so these also uh, are discussed, like how many pairs should you trade at a time, how many positions should you be, in it, be at a time, even if you're a long-term. So there are, um, there are trades that have been in uh, for six months, so um, because oh, of that, because right. I didn't follow my own advice, I didn't follow the Ichimoku. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going back. I'm not making money, so I'm yeah. waiting for those positions to close until I let myself to trade forex again. So okay, you have to be very, very disciplined, of course, with forex. And yeah. um, 
but yeah, so this helps with picking your currency pairs and getting in at the right time and then getting out at the right, right. time. <laughs> Which are all very important components <laughs> of trading. <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, touch, going back a little bit, you, you'd mentioned the election, and, and obviously that's a very hot topic here, at least in the States and, and really worldwide. Um, did you trade during the election? I uh, remained in my positions. I okay. didn't trade the elections. Um, you weren't scared. I know a lot of people were talking where it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously it's very volatile after the fact, but they were talking like a Brexit type of, of issue about halfway through the night. So. Um, what like seven? One basically once Asia opened, things kicked off where the the USD yen just dropped like a hammer. Uh, Euro USD was dropping like all these pairs were getting you know three four hundred pip moves with relatively short period of time. And and basically as they determined Trump was going to win, it just kept going down and down. Where it's like wow, this is this is getting unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it's like. So, so you just stayed, you, so and how I did, did, did your analysis help you stay calm during that absolutely. time? Absolutely. So what I did, and I did that for all my students as well, I loosened up my stop losses because, uh, well, yeah. my motto is what goes up must come down. So right. I- And spreads I, too. Like yes. that's one thing I know a lot of traders, they don't understand. They're like, well, the market never touched my, my price or the, the chart didn't touch my price. They don't understand sometimes, especially new traders, is that you have to factor in the spread at that time, which I trade with Oanda. Uh, I love the broker. I think they're good. However, their spreads get extremely wide and it can certainly stop you out. So I think that's a good advice, like expanding your stop losses. Right. Um, so, I mean, when you know that there is going to be such volatility coming up, the best advice is to just to loosen it up. And that really helped because, for example, with Euro dollar, I was in a bearish position. And uh, so normally I would have my a stop loss at the time, so my stop loss normally would have been at 111, but I loosened it up to 115. Yeah. Uh, and actually 113 for a portion of my trade, and 113 was exactly where I touched uh, during uh, the volatility and then it started dropping. Yeah. Well, of course, everybody was thinking that Trump is not going to win, and that yeah. was uh, what we thought is going to happen, is gonna weaken the US dollar. Uh, the opposite happened. And, uh, but which was interesting because, so my strategy was for a Hillary win, uh, but mm. the outcome of the market was what we expected if Hillary won. So mm. again, we were the winners. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you think that is? I, I've heard a couple of people say that now where yeah. they're, you know, they're like, you know, the, the market's going to be this. If Trump wins, it's going to be this. If Hillary wins, and we've seen like the exact opposite, the, not to keep going back to the USD JPY, but that pair, you know, as, as they thought Trump was going to win, was coming off, coming off, coming off. And then after he won, it went straight up. I think it's went from 101 to, I think it's almost 110 now, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. no, literally, it's just like, won, on. yeah. So uh, it was his speech. So I was up watching and I was looking wow, at my, <laughs> oh yeah, and because I had to do a video for one of my clients, like right yeah. after the election and the news, the results won't come in. So at yeah. by 11, I was like, can you please tell us who won? And I want to do this video. I want to go to bed. And they're like, and up until two, they still weren't sure. So um, yeah, I was awake and the markets really turned when he made the uh, victory speech. At three, that was like 3 yes. a.m.? Uh, I think it was around two, two to three. Yeah. And um, so the problem with Trump, and the reason why a lot of analysts were thinking that the markets were a plume if Trump wins, was because, well, the way that he speaks and the way that he might be a threat to democracy and the world and like everybody. But during his acceptance speech, he really stayed calm and mature and congratulated Hillary for her hard work. And he really came off as a president that you want to have. Right. And I think that is the first time that the market really kind of start ignoring what the way he had campaigned. And it started mm -hmm. to look into his policies and um, what he could actually become. So that is when it is still continuing. It's now exactly a week, a week and one day after the election results. Yeah. And uh, it's still continuing. And I mean, today, yesterday, we didn't have that much movement, but um, so, that is that was exactly the moment of the of the of the switch that all right maybe trump wasn't as bad as we thought okay and the markets shift so now what's gonna happen 
Honestly, right. I actually <laughs> don't know because right. with right. Trump, so last week he surprised us in a positive way. And uh, I'm hoping that he continues uh, surprising uh, the market and everybody else in a positive way. Uh, in which case we could see more strength in the U.S. dollar. Technically speaking, the U.S. dollar has now gotten to, has that momentum behind it. So from mm -hmm. a technical point of view, um, I still remain bullish because with his policies now, it is easier for the Fed to uh, raise interest rates. So uh, there is a combination of that. Um, yeah, he's talked about loosening regulation, like Dodd-Frank specifically for, for the United States, which is really, in my opinion, what sort of killed our industry in the United States. In 2011, they passed out Frank, they limited leverage, the FIFO, um, all these factors. And if he can roll that back even somewhat, uh, it's obviously going to you know, change, the, change the financial landscape for, for us, uh, not only from a trader's perspective, but obviously how, how, how the markets react to it. Absolutely. And Wall Street was pretty happy about it, obviously. Yeah. That's then we have the stock market. But on, on the other hand, though, uh, then the other end of the world, let's say Japan and Europe, uh, they took yeah. it harder than the U.S. So that's sure. why we actually saw that massive volatility with the euro dropping. Sure. Uh, yeah, you have a lot of Japanese clients, I'm yes. assuming. Okay, how, how are they taking? They're the shocked <laughs> because apparently in Japan, well, like at least in the U.S., you have both sides. You have Fox News, you have then yeah. CNN. So you have both, you see both sides. The polar opposite. In Japan, yeah, <laughs> you see the, in Japan, they only see, saw like uh, the basically, um, Pro Hillary side of it. Okay. So when I was talking to them and I was like on Japanese TV like the day before uh, the elections, I was like, well, so Hillary's going to win, right? And I mean, yeah, of course the polls here also showed it, but still, like, I was kind of because I saw all these people, like in, in America, you get a different sense of it because you see Trump supporters, but in right. Japan, they didn't see any of that. Right. And so they were just in the state of shock like, so what, what, what were you telling them like during you know before the election came out and even after like how are you calming down like what advice were you giving to right. them right so i mean it was it's all about risk management so all, all i could tell them was like hey i don't have a crystal ball i don't know what's going to happen i don't think you're absolutely 100 percent right that hillary's going to win we really have to uh set our accounts for whichever direction the market is going to go um and um, so that was the only advice that, that I was giving to them. But after that, so now they're a little bit, so in Japan, they're a little bit more scared because of the tone that Trump has taken before and uh, about Asia and about uh, the partnerships with Japan. So mm -hmm. they're a little bit like scared. I think, I believe Europe is scared as well uh, with the partnership, like global partnerships and globalization in general. Uh, so for that reason, I think they are taking it a little bit harder. Uh, than that in the U.S. So are people winding down positions, or are they continuing just to stay in their their longer term positions and, and ride it out? Like what what are they doing in terms of a market perspective? Well, it, long term traders like myself, I'm just waiting to get to my target because again, like right now, the week after the elections, I think it was just an immediate extreme reaction. Right. And I do believe that we're going to see a little bit of correction or a pullback. Uh, but in the long term, I think especially Europe is now uh, a little bit uh, in danger, not danger, right. but because like, <laughs> we, you know, we saw Brexit happen, right. nobody thought it was going to happen. We saw cops winning, nobody thought it was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Cardinals fan, <laughs> even though I'm from Chicago, still a Cardinals fan. Oh, no. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so that happened. And yeah. then we got Trump winning, nobody thought it was going to happen. So yeah. now. Italy and uh, France, they have upcoming election referendum, referendums that people thought, think is not going to happen. But now it's basically like opening the door and the market, right. the sentiment, global sentiment is behind things that people think is not going to happen. Right. So um, with that, I think that is going to affect uh, Europe a little bit. Harder. So you think people are positioning themselves for the unexpected then? Like they, more I think that is what we should be doing. Because uh, obviously, that I always said before Brexit, if Brexit happens, Trump is going to win. Okay. And then, well, after Brexit happens, like, oh, maybe he won't win, though. <laughs> but then he won. So I think it really is now, like 2016. It's the year, is, year of the surprises. Year of surprises <laughs> and things that people think is not going to happen. So uh, definitely, I think traders should position th themselves or don't believe what the media is telling. Right. It's just basically that. Even if the polls are saying, oh, 100% this is going to happen. 
So what are some steps people can do to position themselves? Is it, you know, reducing position size? Is it, you said, loosen stops a little bit to anticipate the volatility, even though the market might not be going anywhere, it could just do one of these and then come back to, uh, to the median. Um, like what other things can people do? Right, absolutely. So you have to make sure that you have enough margin to tolerate any sort of craziness that could happen during the times of volatility. Check out, check with your broker, see what your margin requirements are doing that. Because like a lot of uh, brokers came out and said, hey, we're like tightening our margin requirements. Oh, I think all of them yes. did, which the NFA came out and yeah. made it mandatory for US brokers to do it. Right, so with that, you have to really check in with your broker and see what is going to make sense for you. If, if, um, necessary you can add more uh, funds to your account just so that you can stay in your if you're a long-term trader of course right. you can stay in your positions during the volatility and then just then the market will resolve itself and hopefully you'll get into get to your target uh, less positions lower leverage uh, spreading between different uh, like not not for example in terms of with uh, US dollar in terms of uh, US elections uh, well, one of my advices was that don't only focus on dollar crosses. Like you wanna, so that's where I got into like a lot of yen crosses uh, trading, like Kiwi yen, Aussie, and a little bit less volatile. So though okay. you wanna spread it out. You wanna take advantage of the volatility, but not too much. To right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, yeah. certainly. Yeah. I mean, from a longer term perspective, like, I could see how the move in some of these pairs could have easily knocked somebody out. Where if you're if you're bullish on the USD JPY and it comes down 300 pips before going up a thousand, you know that's that's going to knock a lot of people out. They're Absolutely. not going to be able to sustain it. Um, you know, if they're over leveraged, if they're if they don't have their their stops set properly, if they're not paying attention to the markets. So that's that's really good advice. Yeah. So yep, that's it. We survived, we'll see what's, what's next. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the next major news event. Like, so, uh, I don't even know if you know this, like did Brexit, have they actually left now? It still has to go up for a vote, was my understanding. So, yes. Or not a vote, but they, they, the populist voted or the people voted, but now parliament has to make that decision whether or not they actually leave. Yeah, so apparently there was some leaked information against leaked information is like the thing yeah. apparently now. In the WikiLeaks. <laughs> what was it WikiLeaks? <laughs> no, it's not leaks. It's a different sort of leaks that uh, came out and said that Theresa May has been saying that Brexit might not actually happen uh, the next six to two, six months to two years. And well, that's the reason why we saw a little bit of a uh, game today and yesterday in uh, British pounds. So it's not finalized yet. There is a lot that they have to do. Of course, that they, they came out and said that the, the leaked information was completely false. Right. And now the market is reacting to the leaked information as <laughs> they have been doing in the US as well. So we really don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, originally, uh, they were supposed to um, take action on, I think it's something 50, action 50. Okay. Um, uh, in February, um, so that's where I was thinking that maybe that is when Pound will bottom out. Um, but now with the news that they might not be able to do it or won't do it in the next six months to even two years, all well, that is good news for uh, for the British pound that we can start well regaining some of the energy that hit like uh, all time lows. So uh, versus the US dollar. So um, now pound dollar is basically I would say one of the riskiest uh, currency base that you can uh, be invested in because sure. well with the US we don't know where it's going to go with. Pound, we don't know where it's going to, where it's going to go. Uh, pound, yen yesterday actually found an interesting signal, at least technically speaking, uh, that it could turn the pair uh, bullish. Technically yeah. speaking, we have so many very concrete signals, bullish signals. But again, yeah. fundamentally, because I don't have that much of a backup besides the leaked information, right. I can't. <laughs> I can't really go ahead and get myself to get into it. But, right. uh, uh, so yeah, so pound yen at a time. Right now, even with Ichimoku, so there are times that obviously Ichimoku is not going to work out. This is one of them. Right. Uh, when the fundamentals are a lot more overwhelming than the technicals. Okay. Um, yeah. So you you look at both fundamentals and technicals. Absolutely. I don't know, like we've spoke with a couple of people now and during the interviews, and you know they're they're either one way or the other. It's like all right, which ones? Which one do we need to look at? And you know, some people are like, yeah, like you, where 
you need both of them encompassing your trading because three, three actually so it's three. like technical fundamentals and the current market sentiment okay what i do i go against what market sentiment is doing so i there are like um indicators that show the majority of traders how their positions like let's say uh, in dollar yen if the majority of traders are short dollar yen uh i would say okay this is probably the time the time to go long uh interesting yeah. So you're a contrarian. I am a contrarian as well. Cool. So I put that cool. also into contra uh, consideration. Okay. Uh, the reason why, unfortunately, I do follow that is because while well, my time at that broker that I worked with, I did realize that uh, the majority of our traders are wrong. Um, so, <laughs> as bad as it sounds, yeah, it's it's like ninety ninety percent of them, or, or even higher, lose their lose their accounts in a in a relatively short period of time. Yes. So, I mean, of course, if more and more people start doing that, then that contrarian signal is not going to work. But as we speak today, uh, still that is unfortunately the case. And um, so I do use the market sentiment as well as technicals and the fundamentals. Okay. That's good. Um, in terms of interest rates, it's been a hot topic for over a year now with, with Yellen and what the Fed's going to do. When do you think they're going to raise rates or are they going to raise rates? Is it possible they lower them? Um, so again, now with Trump winning, now the speculation is obviously going for an interest rate hike. One thing that we need to keep in mind is that it's all speculation talking. Trump hasn't really become president yet. Um, so all these strengths that we see now uh, regardless of what's going to happen, I think the market has already priced in an interest rate hike in December. Right. Okay. So if it happens, I mean, it's going to move the market. I, again, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't right. know what's going to happen. <laughs> but with Trump becoming president, I think the uh, possibility for it has now gone higher uh, because of his policy that it actually helped let more room for interest rate hike. Um, but if they don't, then that is when the well, U.S. dollar might lose ground a little bit but regardless of that i think an interest rate hike is now already being priced in okay all the way into december so if you're bullish i think try to get out i use our positions before uh the announcement comes out and then again make decisions based on what happened next but as of now we really i really uh don't know Okay. What's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to commit no. to any. Yeah, no, no, no. We're, we're not holding your feet to the fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we let you go, one question we always like to, to ask people, um, if you could give one piece of advice to a new trader, what would it be? Um, one. Just, just, just one piece of advice. You can give them multiple. Um, make sure you're eligible to trade for us. What does that mean exactly? That means that yes. uh, you understand the risks involved and that your financial health right now actually allows you to be a forex trader. Um, so by that I mean, I, I don't recommend my students to trade more than 20% of your investable assets in forex. And sure. I've seen so many students or traders come to me and I do an analysis of their financial health and I realize they really should not be trading at all anything right now. They have sure. to take care of their emergency fund, they have other finan financial goals they have to take care of before getting to the forex markets. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is really my first and foremost advice. Make sure your financial health is good enough for you or is healthy enough for you to get into the forex market. Right. Forex market can be incredibly lucrative, but if you don't have the um, essential assets you become more emotional and right. you become more prone to making mistakes and losing everything that you've had and you don't want that to happen right yeah certainly i've uh, i've experienced that a little bit where people uh, they they treat it especially new traders they treat it like this is going to be their their job and so like all right you know i'm going to invest all my money all my time all my effort into it and now you're so dependent on making money to feed yourself. And I was there, I was a full-time trader back in the day. And I remember just being like that, how much stress was put on myself because I was like, all right, I need to pay rent this month. I have, I have desk fees, I have all these things. I'm like, I have $7,000 just to break even just so I don't go in the hole each month. It's like, that can be a lot of stress. And obviously new FX traders don't have that. 
but um, so so to put it in your words, you know, uh, start small. You know, don't don't over leverage yourself. Just put enough in that you can afford to lose. I know that's a popular saying in all the risk disclaimers on websites. You know, don't invest ass, true. It's assets. It's one hundred percent true. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I cut you. No, off. no, okay. go ahead. I was done. I was just you know su suggesting you know along your lines don't invest money that you don't have it's it's not worth it you know it's 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 one of the benefits in my opinion at least it's one of the benefits of this industry is you can start with fifty dollars a hundred dollars and you're not gonna get rich off that by any don't expect to make a thousand two thousand dollars but you can get in there you can test your knowledge with it Atlanta. you can trade one dollar increments at other places you can trade you know thousand dollar increments which is a small size. You can test the markets and make sure it's for you with fifty, hundred dollars um, before actually putting real money behind it. Exactly, and I mean uh, that's why well the slogan with Investiva is grow your wealth. It's not creating hmm. wealth. This is grow the wealth that you already have. As you said, I do not recommend for a trading to become a full time job for anybody. This if you want to have your job. You want to have a uh, stable income, and mm -hmm. forex or any other kind of investment is going to help you grow that. Uh, it's an additional income that it's nice to have. It's not going to. It should not be treated as your rent money. Right. It should not <laughs> be treated as your coffee money. It's not going to work that way. You will just end up completely abandoning it, which is something that we don't want to happen. And, right. But that's why six. Like I think six months is the uh, average of. It's actually lower than that. It's lower. three to five months. Oh, yeah. Yeah, three to five months, the typical retail investor blows out their account. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. my job in investing. Yeah. <laughs> not help right. you not blow out your account. Right. <laughs> so I've been trading for now eight years, and I haven't that's... blown out my account, you know, once. I hadn't had a um, wrong trade up until two years ago. Really? And then oh. I started not taking my own advice. Right. <laughs> uh, but then still, I mean... So that's when I actually turn to a longer, longer, longer term trader. But uh, there are ways really uh, around Forex to really make it work for you and not only survive it, yeah. but also eventually make money off of it. So, nice. Well, yeah. that's, uh, that's positive news for everybody out there listening. You, you can become a profitable trader. You just have to use Kiana's education. <laughs> uh, but thank you again for coming on the show. I, I'm glad we can make it work. It's, uh, I think it's very informative for our listenership. So I'll make sure to put a link at the bottom. So anybody looking to get, get her book, uh, make sure you click on that link and, and purchase her book. Um, but yeah, thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Enjoy your time in Florida. Thank you. <laughs>